my name is Grant Schwartzwelder, president of OTA Compression, OTA Environmental, and uh, welcome you to our ninth uh, webinar. I, I always thought we were doing uh, doing really well with our speakers from on bankruptcy, on with Jim Wicklin, on rural health care, but I think we've stepped it up even a, another level by having uh, Christy Craddock, Railroad Commissioner, on. Um, as you know, we co-host this with the uh, Permian Basin Petroleum Association, uh, Ben Shepard and Stephen Robertson are always very helpful with this. And uh, it's meant as a way with this crazy world to just provide additional information uh, in a convenient fashion to, uh, to the oil industry, uh, to the participants there. And obviously uh, Commissioner Craddock will be able to, to do that. Um, as you know, Commissioner Craddock has uh, been on the Railroad Commission since uh, 2012. I've actually known her since the mid uh, 80s, and I'll be happy to say that we're still just as good looking and youthful now as we were then. Thank um, you, I appreciate that, that's right. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> and, uh, the gray hair gives gives mine away a little bit here, but uh, but no, I've always enjoyed uh, uh, hearing from Christy. I think she's one of the true straight speakers. Uh, when I talk to her, I th feel like I'm actually getting an answer which I think a lot of folks in politics, uh, that's not, you can't say that. So, so because of that, I really enjoy not only uh, hearing from her, but uh, the, her representation of, of our industry. Uh, the format for today is going to be, Christy's gonna have some, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes or so of comments. Uh, we will be opening up for questions after that. You'll see uh, a panel down on the bottom of your webinar screen that you can send in through chat or questions, some questions that you might have. I have some questions that people have already sent me before also that we'll, uh, we'll add depending on whether she uh, discuss those during her presentation. So with that, uh, Christy, thank you again for participating. And I think we've got a great uh, uh, attendance group based on what I'm seeing on the website. So I think a lot of people are interested in hearing what you've got to say. So I will well, mute and let you uh, do your thing. Well, thanks. Thank you, Grant. Thanks for hosting and um, thanks for PVPA. It's nice to see everybody, even though we're not all seeing each other. It's kind of been an odd six months almost. And so I thought I'd um, kind of give you an overview of what we've been doing at the agency. And yes, we are still functioning and we're, uh, we're really working hard to try to function, even though we're not back in the office. So. I'm, I'm going to back up and talk about proration because I think that's what everybody's heard about and then tell you kind of what we're doing going forward. And I would like some feedback too. So I'm glad Grant said y'all may have some questions about what we can do better or where we need to help to at the end. So, um, so I thought I'd go back and kind of remind y'all where we are today versus where we were in production numbers. Everybody watches them, but we aren't that much, we aren't down as much as I thought we'd be. And I think we're finding that the market's really working. And, that whether that's good or bad, the market's working. So we were at the beginning of this year producing 4.2 million barrels of oil a day. Today we're producing just, and these are the fresh numbers as of three days ago, 3.9 million barrels a day. So that's dropped a little bit up and down. We were as low as 3.7 million in May, but when we've come back up a little bit. So Texas is still the largest producer in the country. We're still number one as far as oil and gas production. Uh, about a third of the country's oil, a fourth of the country's natural gas is still coming out of Texas. So we've seen some drop off, but not a lot. Natural gas is down, I'm gonna look at the new numbers. We're down about 3% about is all today. We're at 27 BCF roughly a day. We were as high as 28 and a half, 29 uh, at the beginning of the year. So. Production numbers are staying up, which is interesting. Now that doesn't mean rig counts, as all of you know, are staying up. So we are off almost 70% There's in this state about the number of rig counts that are out there. That's huge for the state and huge for the country. And also I will say, and I will get back into this in a little while, but our, um, our permit numbers are way off. So we, in February, we're averaging roughly 60 a day uh, drilling permits and other permits we were issuing. Today we're issuing about 20, which I'm shocked we're still issuing 20 a day, but that's about our average. And that's gonna affect where we are long-term in budget. Some of y'all have heard me talk about that. So I'll get back to that in a little while. 
So that's kind of where we, that's a little bit of a setup of where we are today. Things have changed quite a bit. And we were beginning to see some change, interestingly, at the end of last year. And I say that because we look at drilling permit numbers. And so drilling permit numbers, even in the fourth quarter of 2019, were off about almost 10% for us from the year before. Now we were chalking that up to CapEx being spent, a little bit of a slowdown, price being $48. You know, there are things that we obviously all look at, but we expected this year to be relatively the same flat, um, but not, not as bad a year as we're having, obviously. So, and then we get to March. And so for those of you who have kids, I, you know, you, you do your world based on where you are in the school calendar year. I happen to be in the school calendar year of spring break as the world kind of changed a lot in the state. And I will say as we went into this year because of COVID going on in, across the world already at that point, we were seeing a slow, slow down a little bit, but nothing major until we hit March. And as I, Dallas grants on a different spring break than, than Austin is. So for those of you, and so Midland, Odessa and Dallas were on one spring break, Austin, San Antonio, Houston on another one. So we were in the Austin, San Antonio spring break beginning of, and I get a phone call. It's, and it, I will say it ruined my spring break in a lot of respects because I got to Colorado when they shut the ski slopes down. So that made the other part of my ruining day. But um, so I get a phone call from actually from Pioneer who said, look, they gave us interesting, good data, I think overall, just the outcome has been different than what we thought. So uh, but they called and they said, look, we think that this is going to get worse and we think that we need to look at prorationing. And, I, and this is Thursday while well, Midland Dallas is on spring break and I'm supposed to leave on Saturday. And I went prorationing. We haven't done prorationing since 1973. Now, some of you who've been around will say we did it into the 80s, but the reality is we haven't limited production since 1973. We may have had, we had to come in, but it was full, full, we'll give you whatever you want past 1973. And I said, and I said, and there's somebody at the agency, or there's a few still alive who might remember 1973, but there's nobody at the agency who knows how to do this. And are you serious? And let us figure out if we can do it at all. That was Thursday. Sunday night, I get a phone call. I said, I got to Colorado. They shut the ski slopes down. So Sunday night, I got to Colorado. And I get another phone call and they say, look, we think it's going to go negative and we're going to file something for proration. So, um, yeah, it was fine that my spring break got ruined in a lot of respects. We all came home Tuesday anyway, because there was nothing you could do um, in Colorado and they wanted you out of wherever you were and it was time to come home. So we went back to work at our agency. And at that point, my office was on the phone with a lot of people we got a filing not till the next week, and it became, can we do this first and foremost? How do we do this? And does it make sense? And so well, that's sort of how this started. And, and look, again, good data, good information that we were getting, and I appreciated the information. So some of you of the 30, almost 30,000 people who watched our hearing for 11 hours, and those of you who are watching got to get up and move around, by the way. We did not move around except the five, 10 minute breaks we had. So we got a lot of information. I took 15 pages of notes and I appreciated the feedback because it wasn't, and it never will be in this industry, a one size fits all, right? Everybody does their business a little bit differently. Everybody has a different way that they fund, whether they've hedged, whether depending on where you are in a field, what your world looks like, it is different. And so look, I, I will say for the Midland folks, I really assume Midland being pretty free market, don't get in our business philosophy that most of the Midland Odessa Permian world would be against proration. It was literally split down the middle as for people that were contacting us, which I thought was interesting, not bad, just interesting and not exactly what I would have expected from kind of Perrine Basin folks haven't grown up out there. So I, we spent a lot of time, my, my daughter's over here being schooled with, thankfully for my nanny, because obviously we aren't at school. I have an eight-year-old for some of you who don't know. And so she's over being schooled and I'm on the phone eight to 10 hours a day because while 
y'all couldn't see or didn't know we were doing stuff behind the scenes, there were a lot of people who contacted us and I appreciate that information. So we had the hearing on what, the 14th of April, um, biggest Zoom call and I'll give kudos to my staff who figured out how to do a Zoom call. Grant, I don't know what you have on, but say you have 50 or 100 on, we had thousands and for whatever reason, we don't know why, South, Co South Korea, is the second largest country that was watching us on Zoom during this hearing. We have no, every state but Hawaii, now I guess they were at the beach, didn't watch, watch this or somebody logged in and watched this, but South Korea. So we don't know what goes on in South Korea, but there might be some opportunity. They apparently want to know what's going on in the oil and gas world, right? So, um, so look, we took a lot of hours of testimony, got a lot of emails back, got a lot of information back, and as the, a week later, if you'll remember, on the, the 20th, the day that we'll live in infamy, for so to speak, we went negative for the first time in anybody's in history at uh, the price of oil did. And I, I, I appreciate this. I have a really good friend who knows what I do, but she wouldn't, doesn't pay a lot of attention like some of us do day to day. And so as the price is going negative, we're getting lots of emails, lots of texts, lots of phone calls. And she happens to text me and says, wow, were you watching this? And I thought, are you kidding? This is all I've done for a month and a half. Yes, I'm watching this. So um, look, we made a decision, I think based on facts and good information it, that we decided not to proration. Partly because had we been able to figure it out, and I still think that's part of where we still have challenges if we need to do prorationing at some point about how we do it, how we do it fairly, how we don't affect people's business, uh, what we, how we would proration. Do you do it by field? Do you do it across the board? Do you do it by production numbers? There are a lot of questions that we asked and we got some good information back. So I think we have a good direction if we ever decide it. But it seemed as we were in April that this market was correcting and historically we have been market-based as an agency and that's my philosophy. It's Wayne's philosophy, and I'm not speaking for him, but I think he said that. So that's the direction we decided not to prorate. The interesting thing is by May, we saw some changes. And so, and here we are in, in July, almost August, it's hard to believe. And you know, the numbers, I would, the number as far as the price of the pump has recovered in a lot of respects. Um, we're at 40, we were at 41 this morning. I don't know where we went today. But we also in the back, ground so we had our conversation going on publicly but part of what else was going on behind the scenes was uh, conversations with other states so i talked to oklahoma north dakota we talked several times to canada alaska several states big producing states were all having conversations wayne christian in effect had a he had a resolution yesterday that he pa they passed with IOGCC. There's a lot of conversation amongst the states about what we do or what we don't do. Does it make sense? How do we do it? And so those conversations were going on because Texas would have led had we done it, but Oklahoma had already made a decision, an early decision not to. North Dakota was kind of waiting on us, but was indicating they didn't want to do anything either. And interestingly, whatever we did, Canada wanted to be in the conversation because they want, they see real value in having relationships with the United States and frankly, Mexico as well. And we were all having problems with Russia and Saudi Arabia and OPEC plus. So, um, and I think they're now having their own problems, which they always do. So that was going on behind the scenes. The other piece that was going on behind the scenes that was in really important that people may or may not realize, and it happened a lot over Easter weekend, because I spent all day Easter on the phone. Um, I did get to go to mass online, but otherwise all day Easter on the phone, was what was going on with the, this, the Trump administration in their conversations that were going on with Russia and Saudi Arabia specifically. So they got engaged, they got engaged a lot. The president got engaged directly. Secretary of Energy was engaged, continues to be engaged. State Department was engaged and continues to be engaged. And so they understand and, can, and want to know how to help this industry. They appreciate that this industry has been an important 
part of the economy, not just for Texas, but the rest of the country, and frankly, the rest of the world. So um, they helped really get um, Saudi Arabia off a of high center and Russia. And so that helped move the dollars and OPEC plus the dollars down in the dollar and then um, amount that they're producing that helped in the short term and hopefully in the long term that they now realize that things, the world's changed a little bit and there is not the need for oil and gas until we all start driving and flying again. So that um, there were a lot, a lot of conversations that really, like I said, came to a head over Easter weekend when you start, go back and look. And we appreciate that. And we continue to have a lot of conversations with them. What can they do? Hopefully there's something that we get out of Nancy Pelosi at all as we're doing this next round of, of uh, COVID help in, this, in these next bills, because clearly this industry needs it, could, would like to be around, and um, they are, it makes a difference for the world. So uh, that was going on as well. So we've, you know, we've made a decision, I think, today, and I don't think that will change as far as proration. We've kind of moved on, and I'm not belittling that, because look, this is going to be a real challenge for all of us who are in this industry, what we do and what we do next, and if we're still around in six months, 18 months, and what it looks like. And I think that, as somebody said to me yesterday, we're living in history that some days we always know we are, but we really know we are today. And that's, that's, and nobody knows what the outcome is. So that was the other piece that I, that was really important to me is figuring out really what we could do to help industry as far as delaying uh, timelines, giving people opportunity to pay later, other waiving rules. And in fact, I'll give it to the EPA. They got in front of us and waived rules, some of their rules before we did. I don't think that's ever happened in the history between us and the EPA, but they did actually. And they appreciated that we needed to do, they needed to do some things. And because of that, it really got us moving, I think a lot quicker than we might have. So we had waived some initial rules in March and we waived some more and some timelines in April. And a lot of that is in, still in place. And we're also working individually with companies you can call and say look we're still having problems that we don't know if we're going to get our p5 for instance in on time or we can't get our wells plugged or we're having some issues we want to know that we want to work with industry and that's been a real important thing for us so that we've waived a lot of rules they're all on our website something like 20 something um lots of notices to operators because we want people to be around the other thing that um, I've asked for and will continue to do so, I think we ought to have, and I asked, um, Hager's office got a, a letter from me again in April to uh, extend your time to pay severance taxes. They immediately rejected it out, of, out, rejected, didn't mean you didn't have to pay them, just give you more time. They immediately rejected it. And obviously he's come out with his budget numbers and a lot of it's related, what, yesterday? that we are gonna be off 4.6 billion from where we thought. A lot of that, frankly, is related to oil and gas. So, um, you know, we were 35% we were of the state's economy. And so that's gonna affect the overall budget as we go forward. So I thought I'd kind of talk about what we've done real quickly as an agency, um, and then talk about what we're doing and where we have some things going forward that frankly, we're gonna need some help on. And y'all, this industry always helps this agency and we appreciate it. So we shut, speaking back to spring break, we were ordered to shut down as an agency. And remember I live in Travis County, which makes it even more interesting. I literally have to have a letter in case I drive around in the city of Austin saying I'm a necessary person at one point because they had shut, if you don't live in Austin, they had shut us down, sort of like Dallas, but Austin was actually pulling a few people over. So it became interesting for us. But um, we shut down as an agency. Those of you who know me know we've talked about IT for years and we are, have moved forward quite a bit. We got a long way to go, but we've moved forward quite a bit. And in doing so, that's allowed us to stay vibrant as an agency and stay online and continue to do our job. So if you've tried to get, and I'm not bashing any other agency, I'm giving you the difference. If you've tried to get a new driver's license recently, 
uh, you aren't getting one. They haven't processed anything, I don't think, since March. If you want a drilling permit, we're processing them, and we're processing them in a couple of days at the most, and that has allowed us to continue to be an active agency. So we shut our agency down right at spring break like to everybody else. We had a shutdown plan, all of our people are working from home. We still have inspectors out. We've done more inspections actually and, and are more efficient and have been in the last 60, 90 days than we are normally. In fact, we're more efficient in a lot of respects in this agency. I think because people aren't taking coffee breaks, but I don't know why, but people are home working and they're hopefully answering the phone or returning phone calls. We have set up through the years, as you recall when I got there in 2012, um, everything was hard copied. You had to have everything in hard copy. We now have where everything or about 80 to 90% of our forms are online. We're accepting things online. Our mail room has never shut down. So, you know, there's a little bit of a lag time between when we get the mail versus when we process. But uh, and on any given day, we have roughly 15% of our people have been at or will continue to be at the office. Why? That goes back to our IT issues. So in February, I, uh, we got money last year during last legislative session to get off our mainframe Fortran based system. You know, some of you heard me talk about it for years. Yes, we are on a mainframe with Fortran based and we have asked for years to have availability of dollars that industry gives us and or other additional dollars to move us into the 21st century, right? It's past time and it, we're finding efficiencies and transparency and it's really important to us long term. So we signed our contract in February to do that. Um, we are working with Groundwater Protection Council to do a, a big chunk of our um, of our mainframe transformation. Why that's important for the for you in the industry? 18 other states have used their uh, their metric and their formulas, and so it won't look a lot different. We don't think than like a North Dakota in a lot of respects. We're not having to recreate the wheel. They've already done a lot of this. But where we really need, and why I said 15% of our agency is still going in, besides our inspectors, we also if you're coming in applying for a saltwater disposal well, we are still doing that in hard copy with maps. It is not automated at all. So people are still applying. We still are looking at the hard copy maps to look at that. And that is kind of in our phase one to, to get that uh, system up and going. Meanwhile, we've already put our hearings division has gone online during this, it was already scheduled to go online. So we're filing stuff online. If you're, a, you're in an old hearing, yeah, we're having to go back in and look at the hard copy, but everything going forward from about the middle to end of March is all online now, and it is streamlining our people. And that will be a priority for us, no matter where the money comes from going forward, is to keep us moving forward in our IT. It's important for us as an agency. There's no reason that we're sitting not being able to process something. Um, the other thing, so IT will continue to be a, a priority for us and has allowed us to do our job. We have had, to my knowledge, as of yesterday, we've had six people total in the whole agency have COVID. We do go in kind of like all of you are having to and clean and do all of those things, but uh, we are not bringing our people back until the governor gives us some directions. So for now, until we're given direction, we are still doing it from home, although We've still got people coming in. Uh, we, as of, I think about a month ago, though, did open our library again. People always want our data. And so you can make an appointment and come in and look at our hard copy data. And um, we are still, we are working with people where you just can't come into the office. So uh, we've had a lot of phone calls from, you know, Pampa and Kilgore and even Midland. We'd like to come in and visit. Well, we appreciate that, but we're still doing all that online. So um, we're, we're, trying to maintain and keep our, our staff safe and as well as continue to, to work forward. And um, the other thing that obviously we've talked about since proration has to do with flaring. Look, ESG and flaring isn't gonna go away no matter whether we'd like for it to or not. Between us, New Mexico, who's put out some rules this week about methane that we're paying attention to, and North Dakota have the highest flare rates in the country. Ours, uh, we've been paying attention to. In the last nine months, that's been a lot of conversation. 
at this agency. For those of you who don't have flaring or don't pay any attention to it, let me kind of give you some things we've done internally and where we're going. So about a year ago, our staff recognized that we were getting a lot more flaring permits. Part of it really is because we don't have enough infrastructure. But part of it is people were planning that way and we they were planning for flaring. And so uh, we started limiting flaring within the agency about a year ago. Uh, if you got a hearing, there's a lot more limiting of flaring. You may or may not recognize that unless you've gone to hearing, but we really have limited a lot more. Some of the numbers that are come out have come out from different groups we dispute, frankly, but part of our challenge is our data while we collect stuff is not as vibrant as anybody would like for it to be. And we've gone in and looked in the last six months whether we could adjust that and TCEQ is doing the same. And the problem is our data collection and where it goes within our agency is tied to our IT and we're behind. So that's gonna be a real challenge for us long-term is to get good data out because that's important for everybody, no matter which side of the aisle you're on on, on flaring. But it is gonna, it's very difficult for us. We have to go to three to four different parts of our database to get flaring, good flaring information. And realistically, until we up, just upgrade our IT, it doesn't work well for us. So that is gonna continue to be a priority for us. The other thing that's gone on that I appreciate Wayne Christian pushing forward, he's had this task, worked with the task force that Texoga and the other associations, PBPA, um, the Alliance, TIPRO have led about what we do with flaring and some flaring uh, conversation and some plans. Part of that has been a, a data sheet, which we had a good draft in February. And so that data sheet is gonna be, is gonna be out for comment. And we're going to ask for that data sheet to be updated if you come in for a Rule 32. Um, there's some information that we'll ask additional information. And so that conversation's ongoing. But if anybody's got any other ideas, either please work through the task force, PBPA, a different group, or let us know directly because we're all looking for good answers. There's no easy answers to this. And the last piece I wanted to touch on real quickly is where we go going forward. Look. I, we're, I'm always, I'm all, my world goes around a legislative session, so we're gearing up for that. Uh, that will be a real challenge, I think, for the whole state as we go into this next session that doesn't start till January, but we have to vote on a budget maybe in two weeks if we get some real numbers, if not by September 1st. So that is our asked for budget. Um, look, we've got a real challenge as an agency. Uh, we are fee-based. That means your fees pay for us to be around. And I told you we're down off 70% in our permitting fees. We're off. And we're, we'll make it for right now, but we are off and we are going to have a real challenge meeting our budget priorities for the next year, year and a half, two years. And so um, we're not asking for fees to be raised. I think that's ridiculous. Part of what we're asking for is we're the only agency that, that we're aware of that goes through dips when an industry goes through dips. So if you're at TCEQ, they, they're fee-based, but they don't dip as an industry, right? They're kind of consistent. Same with most agencies, we dip. And so for perspective in 14, 15, when this industry was down, our agency was off 23% that year, that, that cycle. That's a lot for us. We're only an $85 million a year agency. And that's with well plugging, all of the environmental stuff, everything we do, that's all, and IT, that's all we, we have to spend. That's a pretty small agency budget with roughly 840 people. So in 14, 15, we managed it like we're managing it today, quit hiring people. Well, we got as low as 650 people in coming out of 15. We didn't recover in our numbers as far as employee, employee numbers to where we need to be until December of 2019. It took us five years to recover. Because remember, industry pays a lot more than we do, and y'all can find good quality people faster than we can. So it took us five years to recover in employee numbers. Doing that means we have to retrain everybody, we have to go find them, we have to pay them, and it really frankly is a bad way to do business long-term because 
while our permit numbers are down, our work cycle does not go down much except in one little part that is a big piece of our budget driver as far as income coming in. But we still are doing inspections. We still have environmental stuff. We still have, you know, 250,000 active and inactive wells in the state. We still have uh, pipelines that we're inspecting. So these are all pri continue to be priorities for us. Um, so that's going to be a challenge for us. We've quit. So we've, we've quit hiring people. Uh, except to people that we need to replace immediately, which has to do with uh, mostly inspectors for the most part. Um, we've quit buying trucks. Everybody laughed when I said we quit buying trucks a few couple of years ago, but if you don't buy a truck and you don't have an operating truck, our inspector can't get out in the field. So that's that we've done that, but our IT is moving forward and that's gonna be a priority for us going into this next session. So. I've already started having conversations with leadership within the legislature saying, look, we are a small part of the budget overall, but we bring in and regulate an industry that brings in a big piece. We need some help and we need some consistency in our budget. So we are asking for that again this cycle. Um, the other piece, we've got a real challenge in 14, 15, 50%, almost 50% of our agency was eligible to retire at that point. It's a lot. Today we're at 10%. And one, a couple of those people are, you know, my chief of staff like Bill Black, any of you know Bill, you don't want him to retire and I'm not gonna allow him to retire because he's the only person who knows most of the time where the dead bodies are buried. So, um, so that's gonna be a real challenge for us, how we manage this and what we do as an agency going forward. Um, we are plugging wells too, and we have hit the metrics we need to or will hit the metrics for this year. Next year, that gets real dicey for us uh, because if we've got to go find dollars available, that's an area that we can still maintain and do a good job, but ha may have to go pull some dollars from. So, budgets are a real challenge for us. Eminent domain is going to continue to come up this next cycle. In fact, we're seeing more pipeline challenges across the country. We don't want in it, but we get drawn into it as an agency. I think it's something we need to. Have a continue to have a conversation about as an industry. I think you'll see sand mines and issues come up. I think you'll again see um, the methane and flaring continue to come up in this next session. So it's going to be even though this industry is down, this this is a challenge cycle going forward. And the last piece I want to touch on, even though this is technically a political conversation, but there's an election cycle going on. Um, I don't care how you vote, but please vote. But as you're voting, you need to go look at and pay attention to what the candidates' perspectives are on energy. So if you're looking at, frankly, the Biden-Trump conversation, Trump really gets energy, his people get energy, and they have been very good to this industry overall. The Biden world has taken on the AOC perspective, which is not friendly to this industry. I don't think that's a good candidate, frankly, for us going forward. I think it will change the dynamics very quickly within this industry about how we operate, what we can do, the environmental policies that don't make sense. That's gonna be a real challenge. But the second race that is really important, frankly, probably more important to that one, is what's going on at the Railroad Commission. We have a Railroad Commission seat up. And um, there's a Democrat that is very serious about potentially, and she thinks she's gonna have a lot of money versus the gentleman named Jim Wright that Wayne Christian and I are both supporting, good Republican operator from South Texas, um, who if you haven't met him, at least look at his website, make, an, make a chance, get a chance to meet him. I know it's kind of hard today, um, but he stay, he'll talk to you on the phone. Good guy, I think most people would, will like him. He's the, Maybe the first operator we'll have on this uh, on this commission when we get him elected, but it's really important to have him sitting there instead of the Democrat. So with that, Grant, um, thank you for make, let me make my pitch for for our candidates. But it's important to vote this cycle. And look, I voted in a runoff. If you hadn't voted, put your mask on, put your gloves on, go vote. It's not that big a deal. But um, but voting is going to be really important in this next cycle too. So. Um, I'll be glad to answer questions if I miss something, but that's kind of, we've had a lot going on and we expect to continue to, to be an active um, agency with, uh, with a lot of issues going forward. And we look forward to answer, helping people, but also getting help as we go forward in the budget.
that definitely seems like we've gotten our money's worth out of you uh, this last six months. So uh, um, a reminder to everyone that uh, if you want to send a specific question, we are open for those. Just send those through either the chat or the Q&A part and uh, be happy to uh, uh, include those in the dialogue. Um, uh, Christy, I want to lead off with, uh, we alluded, you alluded to flaring and various environmental, you know, a year ago, six months ago, ESG, environmental aspects of the oil industry was the rage. Obviously, prices dropped, COVID, so it's kind of went away, but it's still there. What, how do you see the environmental side kind of going forward and the ESG and all the corporate uh, governance issues and operational issues? Uh, associated with the oil industry and environmental? Well, actually, while we all think it may have gone away, it hasn't. In fact, I think it's more relevant and more vibrant today. The environmentalists see an opportunity, and frankly, we ought to all be paying attention, whether you're environmentalist or whether you're in this industry, about how we get the flaring issues better under control across the board. And look, there are some people doing a really good job and some people that could do a better job. And uh, so I think that that has made, that the last year people have focused more on that, but I don't think it's going away at all. We know there are flyovers going on across the, the state, quite frankly, particularly in the Permian, but also in the Eagleford. We know that there's data, people are looking for data. That's why I said, we've had conversations with TCEQ because they collect air emissions data from plants and facilities. We collect data in, from what you give us as an industry, and that doesn't always match up. So we're trying to figure out how we have put good data out. If you look at the RISTAD report that was out what, last August, September, about flaring, I actually dispute those numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because I've talked to the guy who did the data analysis back in the end of January. There was a full day um, conference here in Austin with a lot of a lot of players, a lot of think tank that I was the only regulator in the room because TCQ didn't bother to show up. But um, so we sat and had a lot, I mean, full day of conversation, pipes across, I mean, operators of multiple sizes. And the Rystead guy who'd done the report was in the room. And I asked him for, straight up how I got the data. And he said, well, we just estimated based on your stuff. And I went, okay, how'd you estimate? And they said, well, we're th you're three months behind, which is true. The way we collect data and report, when you have a completion report, you think about it, it takes, you know, you've got X number of days after you've drilled a well, it takes time for, you're allowed to report X number of days afterwards, and then by the time we get it in our system. So we're about three months behind. He said, I just estimated everything higher. I went, <laughs> so, you know, anyway, but I think that that's, but that's been the baseline conversation, right, if you think about it. So, I think the, the environmental community, AOC being the leader, Green New Deal, now you got Nancy Pelosi who won't, who hasn't yet put any dollars into uh, PPP dollars directly into this industry and doesn't want to fund this industry. Now, hopefully some people have gotten some, but I'm just saying she wouldn't give direct oil and gas dollars into this industry during COVID unless we agree to AOC, do, um, Green New Deal conversations. Well, we're not going to do that. So hopefully we, our Congress holds to that. So um, they, they see real opportunity. And look, at the end of the day, with methane, and, and like I said, I know that, um, that New Mexico has been working on it too, we're looking at what other states are doing. There is no magic pill for this. But if you're a company who is not paying attention to ESG and methane and, and flaring issues, then you're behind the curveball. And it ought to be a better thought process about how you, if you're going to drill a well, when you drill a well, you need to make sure you've got takeaway capacity. I know there are some challenges with pipes. It's not just the EMP world, it's the pipe world too. Um, so, you know, if your pipe, if your gathering system is having issues, then that needs to be a conversation you go have with them too and get them to upgrade. There are, some, there are multiple challenges in the food chain, so to speak, but that needs, should be a priority, I think, long-term for this industry. It gives us a black eye without us really needing to have one. I think we can solve this. 
and it's not going to be solved overnight. We didn't create the problem overnight, but I think that that's where uh, this this task force group is working through some ideas to to help move that process the right direction. You could argue the flaring because it's just so visible. You can see all this gas being burned. It's just it's so easy to make it a a a, a negative mark for the industry because it's just so visual. That's right. Uh, now the problem with monitoring all that and getting that data is that usually comes with cost for better documentation, better equipment, and now's a tough time to uh, to uh, spend money to do that. But how do you how do you balance that? It is, and I think that's why we'd like some feedback on the data sheet we're, that we're going to propose. Some of it, I think, will be that is data you already probably collect. By the way. Um, and some of it may be too onerous, but I think you've got to figure out what the, what the balance is long-term, and that's what we're trying to do. We've gotten some good feedback already, and so as we put this out for comment um, in April, August the 4th is, yeah, I was going to say, when's my next meeting? August the 4th, um, we'd like the feedback, and so uh, it'll give us more data and more data points, and, and like I said, going forward, that will be important what we have on our books going backwards is a real challenge for us to, to get that good information out, but we'd like to collect better data as we go forward and as we're building this new system. So, um, no, again, I apologize. You know, you've issued out that data sheet. Is it? It's no, out it will be, we will, uh, we've been having lots of conversations behind the scenes. We've actually had a draft of it since February. So on August the 4th, it's on our docket okay. or, we'll, or we'll be on our docket to um, put it out for comment. And okay, so, so uh, we'd like the comments back. Okay, fantastic. You, you mentioned the whole pipe issue because a, a lot of the flaring was going to go away because there was going to be more takeaway. And now you've got the economics. Now it really seems like the environmental litigious nature of the environmentalists are really hurting pipelines, not necessarily Texas, but obviously North Dakota with, uh, with that line. But how do you see that moving the midstream and the takeaway uh, uh, going in the next year or so, because that's so directly related to having a takeaway for that gas. It is, you know, look, pipes are really important in the state and frankly in the country. You're seeing groups like in North Dakota, it'll be interesting to see what North Dakota does because they have a bigger flaring issue than we do, frankly, in Texas, and they're relying on pipes and they don't have as much infrastructure as we do. Um, but we're watching pipes still be built. Um, we've got several that are proposed, some that are still coming online. You know, we have what, roughly 470,000 miles of interstate, intrastate, and gathering line pipelines in this state. Um, and we still see some growth potential and opportunity. And, and again, that's part of the conversation we've been having with the federal government in DC. Uh, they've asked where they can help, and we said, look, we need infrastructure dollars, whether it's roads, pipes, or we need it in the ports too, because you, you know, we can drill all you want, but if you can't get it to market somehow, then it doesn't matter. And so that I think this administration understands is trying to put some dollars into infrastructure across the board. Um, but pipes are continue to be a, a, a real important process for this state and for our inspectors. We have a lot of inspectors out there but that's where I think, again, you're, because of what's gone on in North Dakota and across the country with some pipes, and frankly, we're seeing it in Canada as well, um, that you will see eminent domain and those issues come back again in Texas in this, in this legislative cycle. And how we handle that as an industry and get good information to people, but also, I, you know, and some of you have heard me say this through the years, as an industry, we ought to be out communicating better with the communities that we are going through, that we are working in, so they understand what we do and how important it is that we do have safety, that we do inspect, that we do the right things by, with this industry. Even, and the, the few players that, are kinda, that don't always do the right thing, they need to get some pressure from industry and frankly from us as regulators to continue to do that. So I think the pipe issue will continue to be a real challenge for us as far as building new pipe. People are 
either more sophisticated or getting more information, good or bad, off the internet. And so that is uh, that will that's a, a challenge for us. But if we don't have pipe infrastructure of all kinds, then we won't be able to continue to be a vibrant industry across the country. An unrequested compliment uh, to you is that I think you've done a good job of helping to educate and kind of telling folks what the reality of the oil industry is about because there's clearly a lot of misguided uh, thought out there. So um, can you speak to uh, plugging in uh, orphaned wells? And, uh, you know, it used to be years ago that that's something that can just kept on getting kicked on down the road. You do an acquisition, well, you didn't worry about it because you would sell it to sell those liabilities. But it sure seems in the last, I don't know, few years, that has really become a true liability, a true thing that someone's looking at. And I know the Railroad Commission is spending a lot of money to plug wells, but it's, it's a growing and growing thing. So what's, how, how does that get handled in the future? So I think we'll continue to have more abandoned wells and orphan wells come on. This is just historically what happens when we have a downturn, by the way, this isn't new. We've wa we watched it at 1415, we've watched it historically. So for those of you who don't know or don't remember and know how my budget works when we're looking at abandoned wells, in 1999-2000, industry decided we needed to do something with abandoned wells in this state and that that the Railroad Commission was acquiring them, but we weren't plugging them very vibrantly. We didn't have a lot of dollars to put to it. And so we, since the 2001 legislative session, have had in our priority and had dollars from industry to plug abandoned and orphan wells in the state. So we, uh, and we've continued to do so. We prioritize them. So when we started in that, in that 2001 cycle, we had 19,000 in this state at that point that we're sitting. What's interesting is uh, if you go have a conversation with Canada right now and Alberta specifically, they have like 200,000. <laughs> so we not, we're not in as bad a shape as some places. Now, uh, so we have had, a, we have a system that we go out, we do an inspection. And basically if somebody, say somebody abandons an, a well, or has, we, there's an orphan well sitting out there we identify it as such because that operator no longer exists for whatever reason. We have kept their bond, right? You have to have a bond. We've kept the bond and gone through a process. It basically takes us a year to 18 months to acquire a well mm -hmm. within our, on our books after it's been a, that company has gone out of business. It takes a process. So today we're ha probably going to have abandoned wells. We won't see them until next year or the year after just a, as a little bit of our perspective on our books day to day. When we acquire that well, we go out and inspect it and we rank them. So, um, and so we have um, roughly today, we have 76 bay wells, um, one of which we are plugging and we are $3 million into it and still plugging, by the way. When you're in the water, we always estimate it's a million dollars, but it's, this one's been really tough and it's leaking and it's a priority for us. Uh, otherwise, we, we prioritize them. Um, we have roughly 6,6500 on our books today. At, and our goal has been, in the last few years, we've prioritized plugging abandoned wells. So if you go two years back, um, not this legislative session, but the session before, we went in, and I will say legislature understands plugging, they understand abandoned wells. They, they, they may not understand much else, but they understand abandoned wells. And so they gave us roughly $38 million to go in and plug abandoned wells in the state. We were given a goal of, to plug roughly 2,000 in a biennium. We plugged 3,000 last biennium, which is a lot of wells. And so, and we put them out to bid. Um, we have to follow the same rule, and those pluggers have to follow the same rules you do. We get some of that. Sometimes people think that we don't require that. We, we do. It's the same rules that anybody who's privately plugging them. And so we plug 3,000 wells in the last biennium. Interestingly enough, as we started the, this biennium that we're in, which is last September, we had the exact same number of wells that we started with. <laughs> which, um, so we acquired that many again. And so, and, and on any given day, about a thousand, on any given year, about 
anywhere between a thousand to two thousand come on our books and then go off our books because people get their p5 reactivated or somebody comes in and, and buys that that um you know lease and they acquire that as well so um so we have for this biennium that we are currently in about 38 39 million dollars again and with the goal to plug 1400 wells a year as well as do site remediation and i kind of leave that out but site remediation is part of that abandoned well dollars that we are using and that we've gotten additional dollars from the state and we are doing roughly 200 site remediations a year as well so we will hit that metric for this year the biennium we'll hit our metric Next year, as our dollars go down and become less available because of fees, that's going to be a challenge for us. And we're kind of trying to explain that to people in the legislature as we speak. So um, if people, but people have an impression, and I always want to clear this up, that, that we have a certain fund that that's all it does is abandoned wells. Interestingly, that fund that started out in 2000, 2001 to be the abandoned well fund has now become our operating budget because we in 2011 became fee-based only as an agency. So we don't have a specific fund. We obviously have bonds that industry pays and, and the other fees that you've paid in as an industry, that's what has historically been what we use to plug wells. So We've plugged the highest number in the last couple of bienniums because we've gone and asked the legislature for more dollars specifically to put in their abandoned well program. So, but it continues to be a priority for us and, and the environmental piece obviously is really important. But I wanna point out Grant real quickly, we plug a, a bunch of wells, but industry plugs over 95% of the wells that are plugged in the state. So it's a, what we plug is a real small percentage across the board. Very good. Thank you very much, Christy. I, um, I really appreciate the time. I know you've got quite a bit on your plate, but I think informing the industry has always uh, been a priority for you, and I think this is very helpful. So it's, uh, um, do you have, if you have any last comment? I was just going to say thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate getting the feedback, too. And if anybody's got problems or questions or things we can help you with, will you please call my office. I mean, it, even though we aren't in the office, we are answering phone calls or you can email us. We wanna make sure people are around and are getting what they need from us as an agency. This is not the let's shut the industry down philosophy. It's let's work with industry so they're still around in, and we wanna make sure that that's occurring. So thanks for the opportunity. I sure appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, Christy. The, uh, as a reminder to everyone, we have some, uh, other good speakers coming up. We have the EPA Regional Administrator, Ken McQueen, coming up. We have the TCQ Administrator, Lindley. Uh, and then we also have the former president of Pioneers Water uh, Division, and he was with the private equity back group talking about the water uh, side of the industry as well. So uh, I think we've got some good topics coming up and urge you to share that with other folks and participate as, as you see fit. Christy, thank you, and everyone have thank a great you. day. Thank you. You too.